So I'd like to welcome you to our third March Madness uh, webinar. So this time we're going to be looking at analyzing bathymetry. Uh, this series has been going on now for a couple of weeks, and we've got one more after this to talk about in a second. So uh, let's get started. So today we're going to focus on analyzing bathymetry and some of the tools that are built into SonarWiz to help you uh, take a look at your data set in different ways and try to understand what's going on. And you know, we often focus in our classes on kind of the big things. Uh, and we've even done some uh, webinars in the past on some of the tools like our beam performance test and the patch test and that kind of thing. But we have a couple of little built-in utilities that can be really useful if they're used in the right way. And uh, so we're gonna start here. So, so far uh, in this series, in February 28th, I guess that's not March, we did the new Geodesy engine and uh, we covered all of the kind of nuances of this brand new Geodesy engine that's built into SonarWiz 7.10. Then uh, two weeks ago, we did the magnetometer updates and I went through some changes uh, that have been done in magnetometer in the last year that have really kind of spruced up mag in SonarWiz. There's uh, it doesn't go through everything that you can do in magnetometer, but there's some really nice uh, new features in there. This week, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Um, really, I just have a story to tell about a data set that we have been working with uh, since August. And uh, while I was processing it, it occurred to me that it might be useful to just show people how we go about doing some of our uh, detective work in uh, support. And then uh, in two weeks' time, leaking out of March altogether is uh, SonarWiz integrations. And these are integrations with third-party products like your GIS. And in particular, we're announcing um, some integrations we've done with TerraDepth. So this is a 3D uh, cloud-like environment where you can host your own survey data and put it up in the cloud. And SonarWiz has some uh, compatibility of that. So we wanted to talk about that. So just a little bit of housekeeping. If uh, you have any questions at all uh, while we're doing the presentation here, you can either use the tools in the GoToWebinar interface. There is a section where you can raise your hand and ask questions. If you type them in the, the little box, uh, either myself or Patrick will answer them. And uh, if there's a enough good ones we'll take some time at the end of the talk and go over those um, just so i can fill you in a little bit more if you're watching this on the web after the recording is over or you have uh, a, a question occurs to you later you can just send it to support at chesapeaketech.com and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about SonarWiz. so we've done one other um, webinar on bathymetric utilities a couple of years ago and it was this in particular covered two parts the patch test utility and the beam performance test and in that our general manager went over a pretty nice data sets where he was processing uh, a patch test and did some beam performance tests and gave some good tips on how you should collect that kind of data if you want to evaluate how your sonar is doing uh, so I'm going to not talk about those in this particular talk and show you some of the other data or uh, other utilities that are built into SonarWiz. So uh, to start with, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about uh, where we are in the world and why we collected this data set and uh, sort of what I was trying to do, and then walk you through uh, what I did to try to understand what we had collected and whether our equipment was working properly or not. So uh, over the course of this talk, I'll talk about our profiling utility, so you can how you can export profiles out of SonarWiz wherever you draw a mouse. Uh, we have a cross-section report utility that allows you to do cross-sections cross at regular intervals across the survey area. And I'll show you how to set that up. It's kind of a uh, process to get that going. And then we have the volume and difference calculator, which can be used in a couple of different ways. And I'll show you two of them. You know, one, you can, it's used for comparing two different uh, grids to each other and computing both the difference between them and if they're 
uh, bathymetry grids that would calculate the volume difference that is generated. So this would be useful if you're doing dredging or if you're comparing two surveys with each other. And then uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is a, our A minus B comparison tool, which once you've computed differences between the two, um, where, where did those differences actually occur? And in this, this tool is not just about working with bathymetry, it can also work with uh, backscatter. And then finally, um, this is just a fantastic data set in three dimensions, and I want to show that off before uh, we finish off the, uh, uh, the webinar, because there's some cool tools in SonarWiz that can make that look really awesome. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, where we're at. So this data set uh, was collected as part of uh, some trial runs that we were doing here at Chesapeake to make sure that our software updates that we had put into the program last year uh, were all functional. And we called up uh, partners of ours, Echo 81, uh, and they offered, generously offered to let us, they gave us a boat and a driver and some equipment that we could go out and test our software with. And so we're here in Georgia, at Lake Hartwell, uh, which is about, uh, let me zoom out, you can see where Georgia is if you're not from the US. We're kind of in the southern part of uh, the East Coast here. And uh, in fact, uh, not far from Echo 81's headquarters. And they chose the location for their headquarters here because it was right next to an interesting lake and we're gonna get to play around with it. Okay, so here's the data set. And uh, we actually were out uh, for one day, and this was just a piece of what we did. We had done a patch test, and we were running through some different settings and everything. And we collected a multi-beam data set here with an R2 Sonic. And this is just the raw, unfiltered data. And there's lots of things about this that pop out right away. And the first one is it's, it's uncleaned. I haven't gone through and cleaned it up. And in fact, uh, while we were collecting the data, we were having trouble with the bottom tracker and it was having trouble locking onto the seafloor. And there were, there's a really good reason for this, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. The other, uh, so when we got back to the office, um, we also found out that there was another boat on the water from Echo 81 and they had collected, um, they had collected Edge Tech 6205 data. So this is an interferometric data set and this one has been cleaned up a little bit more, so uh, it's a it's a little bit more polished than what we have done with the the multi beam data set here. But this was, I believe, this was collected on the previous day. And if we look at the sonar data, this was on eight nine, and ours uh, was collected on eight ten. So uh, the multi beam data was collected in the same area on the next day. And the first question uh, I wanted to know uh, was just well, how close and similar were these two data sets? We plotted them on top of each other. You can kind of tell that there's, um, there are differences, um, not just over the area, but the way they, they present themselves. And one of the easiest and quickest way to compare two data sets is to use the cross-section tool. So you find that on the bathymetry tab over here, and you can click on cross-sections, and you can just draw, the, your cursor turns to a little, uh, plus button and you can just draw a profile wherever you want uh, to see them. And this shows the profiles in a couple of different ways. You can color them by channel number. You've got port and starboard channels. Uh, you can do it by survey line. Like if you, you can turn off all the two track lines and just see how the two are comparing to each other. You can uh, do it by depth. This is more of a, what you'd see in, you know, GIS program or something. Uh, and even this uh, kind of fleet or mousy histogram view. And to me, it looked like the match was pretty close between the, the survey we did uh, with the R2 Sonic and the one that was done by the 6205. So I was happy to see that they weren't too far off, but exactly how much uh, is too far off. So here, uh, one thing you could do is export the points out of this profile. Not, not everybody knows you can do this, but once you've drawn a profile, you can actually dump these things out and um, put them into Excel and plot them up and take a look at them. Another thing that might be uh, useful is running uh, profiles across the stream, for example. And rather than do it one at a time the way I just did, 
uh, we have a utility that's designed to do that. It, it can actually, uh, I'm just gonna turn off the edge tech here for a second. And let's say we wanted to run profiles down this uh, creek. So uh, the tool we would use for that is our cross-section generation utility. So this one, you start by putting in a either a feature or a track or a track line. So if you have data acquisition, you have the track line buttons here. If you don't have that, you can use a feature and just draw a polyline. So I'll do it uh, with the polylines here. So I'll add a feature. I'm going to add a line. And this will be the uh, root line of our profiles. So I'm going to draw this across like this. And now what I want to do is uh, go over here. Uh, we're going to create a grid over this. I've already done that. So there's a grid here. This is our R2 Sonic grid. And you can see when you grid this data up, it's there's got a lot of spikes in it. Here's the unclean parts, and then all this noise in here. It's in here and it's in the edge tech data as well. Uh, the edge tech data has been cleaned, so it looks a little nicer, but the, there's definitely something going on on the seafloor that I want to share with you a little bit later. So what you do is uh, select the grid that you're going to run profiles across, and then you right click here and go to um, cross-section report and then what we're going to do is choose our root feature actually in this case I've got a whole bunch of other features in here this is kind of getting confusing let's use the other way so we'll do it with the uh, line manager here and I'll put it in the same place so I've got a line and now I'm going to select here, go to cross-section report. And the root line this time is going to be line one. That's this guy right here. And I'm going to draw the lines on the right-hand side of the line. And we're going to go this way. So a number of lines to generate. Let's do like uh, 10 of them. And we'll do them at 25 meter spacing. And then we can make a, a cross-section report choose some um, image to put in the report there we'll do this and then you can hit this test button and it'll tell you how how many profiles it's going to build uh, before it actually does it but i'm going to click ok here so sonar uh generates those lines here this is a PDF version. You can export these reports out as Excel files or as Word documents, or in this case, I did a PDF. So here's our root line, and then it did five additional profiles down this, the track line here. And it's generated this report for us where we can see the channel as we're going down away from um, this guy. So it's working its way down the channel here, and it shows you in the report where you're at and what where these three profiles are located so again that's that's interesting you could you could do this on the edge tech data set and you can do it on the r2 sonic data set and compare the two and see how close you're getting but it's still a visual comparison so the next tool that i want to show you is a better way to compare two data sets to each other and that is um, the volume and difference tool. And there's two different ways you can use the volume and difference tool. The first one uh, is what I'm going to show you right now. So it uh, compares two different data sets to each other. And here, what we've got are we've got a grid for the R2 Sonic data here, and we have the Edge Tech data here um, also as grid. So we've got these two grids, and I want to compare those two to each other to to see if there is a vertical offset between the two, just how close did these two systems get. So let me uh, turn them both on here. And the way it works is you pick a top data set, and I'll pick the R2 Sonic as the top. And you right click it, and you go to uh, Volume Calculator. 
And for the top, you can enter in the R2Sonic grid. So we'll go over here to our grids folder and pick R2Sonic. And for the lower surface, we'll pick the edge tech grid. And then here, we're gonna write down what the output is gonna be. And I'll say R2S minus edge tech. So it's gonna subtract the, the top grid from the bottom grid, or from the bottom grid from the top grid, and it puts the output here and it generates a report. Another option you can do is just set a fixed uh, level, like you can subtract the, uh, you can, if you know what a depth surface, like from the C surface, you could set the depth equal to zero and subtract a grid from that to get just a total volume. But we're gonna subtract two grids from each other. Let this run. Okay, so now it's computed the difference and it's generated this report. So this is just a text file, uh, this r2s minus et.txt that you can use. It says a little bit about the upper surface, how big was the area of the upper grid, and it tells you which one it was. So this was the R2 Sonic grid. The lower surface was the edge tech grid and it gives you some statistics about that. And then it, this difference grid here, which is shown in red, it shows that it only can subtract where there's an intersection between the two surfaces. So it's the, you know, the smaller of the cell sizes and then the actual area of overlap be between the two grids. And then you get these univariate statistics, and this is what we're actually interested in. So the total number of cells that were subtracted from each other is listed up here. And down here uh, in this group, we see that the mean difference between the two grids was zero, or about 0 0.001, so that's one millimeter difference. And the median offset was zero. Now part of this is um, we'd already tweaked this a little bit, to make it match as, as well as we could get it. And so what we're seeing here is that, that we've aligned it very well. Over here is uh, statistics uh, in percentiles. So if you are familiar with these, like the middle 50th percentile is the median. So that's saying that the, the difference between these two grids uh, in the middle of the data set is zero. And from about uh, 25 to 75, it ranges from five centimeters here to about from negative five centimeters to plus six centimeters. And that distance is the interquartile range, which is this guy here. So about 11 centimeters. So overall, the R2 Sonic and the Edge Tech data set are, me are matching each other extremely well. Here is the standard deviation, which is a little bit higher than the interquartile range. So it's saying that the standard deviation the standard difference between the two is about 19 centimeters here. And at 95% confidence, you can multiply this by two, or about 1.9. So now you're talking about you know, 30, 40 centimeters of average difference between the two of them. So this is uh, one way to use that um, difference tool. Here's the difference grid. It's all colored red right now, but let's give it some nice colors. And we can actually see where uh, this difference was. So when we subtracted the two grids, there's an area over here that is got, a, it's the area on top of this slope is looking like the two different data sets uh, were off from each other. There's also, um, notice that I cleaned the, the R2 Sonic data, or excuse me, the Edge Tech data, but the R2 Sonic is just the raw. So you can see in here where the edges of the swath needs to be cleaned up, and these red uh, targets here as well. There's something going on there. That, that indicates a big difference between the two. And that's what I wanna show you at the end of this talk. So the, the other way that you can use that um, volume and difference tool, that, so that calculates the difference, but it also calculates the volume uh, difference between two things. And the easiest way to show you uh, how that works is to add a third dimension to this. So at the same time as they were collecting 
the bathymetry, the, the sides or the edge tech bathymetry, they also have we're towing along a sub bottom profiler. And if we look at one of these profiles here, let's select this guy. Uh, we have the sea surface, or excuse me, the here's the lake surface at the top. Here's the sea or the bed of the lake right there. And we have some penetration down you know, to about maybe about 10 meters. There's not a whole lot to see in this data set, but um, what I have done, you know, I was really looking for something we could subtract from each other. Um, what I decided to do was just put a fake um, surface in there. Let's say that we wanted to dredge out a box here that started uh, on this line here, went down 30 meter to the 30 meter contour and then back up again. And we're just gonna dredge out that volume. So for example, if we do this, uh, I've already drawn in the box. So what we're gonna do is take this box and we're gonna dredge out that section. So what I did is I went through each of the track lines or the sub bottom lines and I added in a marker at the 30 meter line. That's this, these lines here. And now uh, I'm gonna export that out. So if I go to feature crossings here, or excuse me, uh, go down to features. I call this RF0 just so I could figure out, uh, give it a name. I'm gonna export. I'm gonna export a feature by name and I'm gonna do all the RF0s as an XYZ text. And this is gonna be saved in the shape file here. So it creates a uh, text file, and inside of that text file is going to be the uh, eastings, northings, and depths. It's taking Notepad a long time to open this file. So here it is, eastings, northings, and depths. And it's basically just along these profiles here, right there, and there, and there. So if I grid those, with the gridder, I get this. And this surface is below the bathymetry. And I can show you that here in our 3D display. So if we go here to the view and enable this here, and we'll put the R2 Sonic data set on top of it. Make sure that guy is the same color scheme here. So R2 Sonic first, and then we'll put the reference data underneath that. And there you can see it. It's kind of uh, exaggerated here. You can use this slider here to show how much you've exaggerated it. So now that's about four times exaggeration. Now this is fake. I just drew this in there. But now what we're going to do is if we dredged all of that out down to the surface, what would be the volume that was actually being removed? And that's the second thing I want to show you about this volume and difference calculator. So the way you do that, uh, again, take your upper surface and open the volume calculator. So this time it'll be the R2S, R2 sonic depth, and our lower grid will now be the RF0 grid. And we'll put this, this will be R2S minus RF0. And now we'll run this guy. So here's the computed difference, and Notepad is opening this up. So again, the upper surface is listed here, that's R2 Sonic, and the lower surface is our RF0 grid, which is below the, the lake bed. And here we have the univariate statistics. So on average, the difference was about 10 meters. 10.11 meters here. But if you keep scrolling down here, it shows you the volume that was ex 
that would be excavated at that. So the total area that was decreasing is 8,100 or 8,100 meters square meters. So that's the red area here, the surface area, and the volume, the net volume change there it was about 10 times that. So it's 82,000 cubic meters uh, if we dredged all of this out. So it calculates uh, the volume as well as the difference. If we go back to the, the two differences here between these two data sets, when we subtracted and looked at the difference between the uh, R2Sonic and the EdgeTech, uh, this doesn't really identify, well, you can look at, with your eyes, and you can see where there's been a change. But we have a different tool that is designed to just isolate where changes actually are occurring in a data set. And it can work with bathymetry data or backscatter data. And I can show you uh, how both of those work. So it's basically a variation on this theme here. Uh, we get some of the same information, but we have the ability to run a filter over it and only look at the parts that are interesting to us. So to start with, I'm gonna turn off the difference grid here and turn back on my two edge tech and R2Sonic grids. So we'll start with the R2Sonic on the top and do this A minus B. So it preloads R2Sonic there. And so we're going to compare this grid to our reference surface, which is the edge tech surface. And we'll call this uh, our A minus B. And we're interested in, say, all the cells. Uh, we're going to ignore any change that's smaller than about 50% of the maximum difference. And then look at, uh, let's just do this on two meter by two meter basis. So the first thing, uh, you get two different grids out of this. Actually, you get a bunch of grids. The first thing it does is it normalizes the two grids to each other. So this would allow you to compare two grids that have a, a bias offset from, from them. It's not just bathymetry. You can you can compare, you can do this with backscatter, and you can imagine that the backscatter from a side scan is gonna look different than the backscatter from a multi-beam. They're gonna have completely different mean values and different standard deviations. So the, the first thing that we do uh, to perform this calculation is normalize the, uh, the two different surfaces. And the way that is done is kind of like calculating a Z statistic. You subtract the mean value of the grid from itself, and then you divide by the standard deviation, and that gives you a normalized grid. And that's what these guys are here. So if we look at the, the histogram of these things, um, I'll right click here and go to, oops, let's go to display. The histogram here ranges from about 0 0.6 to five. And this is the histogram of the R2Sonic normalized grid. and we look at this one, it ranges from about 0 0.4 to about five. So after you, you know, we would expect these two to have similar ranges because we know that the bathymetry came from the same seafloor. But if you were comparing backscatter, which I'll do in a second, uh, it's not true that those things would be exactly the same. So you have to normalize it first. Then you subtract the two from each other and you get a different surface that looks very similar to this, this one here, the one that we did with A minus B. Uh, but what we can also do is filter it and just only show us the parts that we're really interested in. So I'm, these white pixels here are areas that were greater than 50% difference. And so we can isolate those spots uh, and actually focus in on them. And you can, if this were a backscatter grid, for example, and I'll show you that in a second, it can highlight areas that where the backscatter has actually changed, or in this case, it's showing us there's big differences between the edge tech data set and the R2Sonic at these locations. And if I show you these, you'll see that they actually occur right on top of all of these volcanoes. Not all of them, but many of them. And that is another clue to what's going on here. So the first data set was cleaned up. 
we've kind of removed a lot of the noise in the water column. With the second data set, we left it in. And uh, even if we just look at the biggest differences, these are exactly located at the same spot uh, on this data set. So there's something interesting going on there. Uh, just to detour a second so I can show you what a, the difference for a backscatter looks like, I'm going to switch to another project that has uh, three different backscatter grids in it. And then we'll come back to this one to finish this off. So for this data set, uh, this was provided to us by Edge Tech just so that we could develop this utility. They had three different systems, system one, system two, and system three. And they surveyed the same area with these different systems. So system one, this is, and what we're looking at now is the backscatter from, from system one. And its range goes from about 67, that if we here scale this to data, it ranges from 55 to 84 in this over the survey area. If we look at the next one, scale to data, this one is again, you know, 50s to 80s. So those are pretty comparable. We could use the difference tool there. I think this third one is quite a bit different. Scale to data. Nope, it's it's pretty similar. So 48 to 78. So if you just subtract the two of these, they don't necessarily, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You can imagine if we multiply this whole thing by 10, then, then they would, the amplitudes would be completely different. We're, what we're really interested in is are these relative changes moving around? And the A minus B thing because, or to utility, because it normalizes the data before it does the analysis, it can handle that. So I made uh, three grids. Well, we should do that. Let's make three grids here. So we'll do this one. This will be system one. So create a new grid. We'll call that system one. And we'll do the amplitude. And then we'll do system three as well. Create new grid. This will be system three. And now what we want to see is where do these two difference or where are these two systems showing changes in the backscatter? If we just turn them on and off, you can kind of see they're mostly the same, but are there any areas that are different uh, between the two surveys? So A minus B, we'll do system one. And then for this one, we'll go to grids and pick system two or three, excuse me. And this will be A minus B. And here again, we set the size area that we're going to look at. Um, we'll do this one a three by three uh, meters uh, window. So we're looking for change in a three meter by three meter window. And we're going to ignore cells below, say, let's just say uh, 25%. So that one actually, it's finding too much stuff. So maybe we should do a little bit higher, be a little more discriminate. So let's say 50%. So we want system one and system three. These are our two data sets. And then here is, We'll make that in color so it's easier to see. These are areas where the change between the two data sets is greatest, and it exceeds about 50% of the difference. So it looks at all the differences and kind of just takes the upper 50% of them. So these are the biggest areas that we're changing. There's this patch down here in the southwest corner and this patch in the northwest corner or northeast corner that uh, if we look at these two data sets, those are where the biggest changes are. So here in this data set, this area is kind of gray, um, but not super dark. But here in the second data set, it's, 
it is quite dark. And there's another area down here that changed quite a bit between those surveys. So this uh, right down in here where my cursor is, and you can, this tool, this A minus B tool will highlight where those areas of greatest change are. So let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to the Lake Hartwell data here, because I want to show you um, exactly what we think is going on uh, with these spots here. And it turned out it was kind of a surprise to me because I had never, uh, it, this is a reservoir, it's not a regular lake. So they flooded this in the 50s or 60s, filled the area up with water, and uh, we're surveying what's been left there for the last 50 years. And like I said, we were having a lot of trouble getting the bottom tracker to lock onto the seafloor. And it turned out the reason was uh, there's a ton of trees down there. So we have side scan for this area and you can kind of see um, where the, if you're looking straight down, this is a map view, but you can see these areas where trees have fallen over. And there is a really cool uh, feature in SonarWiz. So if we look at the water column data from the side scan, then we can pull this thing into three dimensions and actually extract out the, data from the water column and project it in three dimensions along with all of these other data sets. So here I want to show you the, here's a side scan uh, waterfall display and you can kind of see the, here's all the trees off on the seafloor, but some of these poke up into the water column and uh, I want to show you how we can plot those things here in SonarWiz. So first of all, we want to uh, export out the, we'll take these uh, sub-bottom lines and make them three-dimensional. So we're going to send those out, turn them all on here. So we go to or, uh, post-processing, export, and then export files to 3D viewer and then export sub-bottom files. So I'll check them all. This takes a second. So here's the 3D viewer. This comes with SonarWiz. So here we have, this is everything below the lake bed that we can see. And the next thing uh, we'll add is our bathymetry. So we'll go to file, load grid, and we'll take the uh, R2Sonic, or actually let's take the edge tech grid, so it's already been cleaned up. So now we've got the edge tech grid on there. And the uh, sub-bottom profiles um, are below that, so you can see this. We can add our we can add our side scan to this. So we'll go here to GeoTIFF folders. I exported this earlier. And here's our GeoTIFF. Oops, let's do the one on the, my desktop. There's that. And you see side scan doesn't have an elevation data uh, information in it. It's just a flat surface floating around on top of the data set. So what we do is we snap and register the two together. So select a grid and then drape the image on top of each other. Now they're snapped together. We're starting to see a better picture of what's going on there. But here's where things get really cool. So there is a utility in SonarWiz here where you can extract the water column. So extract water column data from your CSF files. So these are your side scan files. So if I take one of these lines and export the water column data, it takes a second to, to pull it out. It converts the water column into like a uh, sub-bottom profile. 
or so that we can display it in the 3D view. And I can add those in here. So you load them as XYZA files. And they're in our CSF folder. Other direction. So let's pick uh, the port side. We'll add that. And you kind of have to play with the colors here. So I'll change the color palette to uh, from rainbow to MSTL bronze. It's one of my favorites. And change the scale down to about 100. And then when we zoom in on this, uh, you can see the trees in the water column right over the top of the seafloor here. Um, and this is what was causing so much of the trouble. Um, with our multi-beam, it was picking up these trees and as we were surveying along the seafloor here, it was knocking, you know, it was picking up all of these trees and we were having a lot of trouble uh, keeping it locked on until we got away from the creek. So when they flooded this reservoir, they didn't log the, the trees down, they just flooded it as it was. And in fact, there's other parts of the survey area where there's uh, old roads and bridges that were submerged also, which is uh, pretty interesting actually. All right, back to my show. So uh, in conclusion, there's there are quite a few tools built into SonarWiz that can you can play around with and analyze things and take a look at. Uh, in the previous presentation uh, a couple of years ago, we went over the patch test tool and the the uh, beam performance test. In this one, I showed you how to use the profile tool, which is great for creating exports. You can draw a line, you can export out a single track line and and work with that data. With the cross-section tool, you can create profiles at regular intervals. So in sh you pretty much uh, have to do a straight line. So you can draw a straight line with either a feature or a, um, use it, either use a feature or a line. I like using the track lines. I think they're easier to, to use. And then it will generate profiles perpendicular or parallel to that track line. So you can go across your entire survey area that way. The volume and difference utility is it takes two grids and it subtracts them from each other and it computes the statistics between uh, the results. So if they're if they're very close together, you, you can see that their mean difference would be zero or very close to zero. And you can see what the standard deviation is. So how much noise is there between those two data sets? The other thing you can do with volume and difference is compute an actual volume where if you say a pre-dredge and a post-dredge survey, um you can uh, see the uh volume difference that you've computed and put that as part of your report and then finally we've got this a minus b tool which will allow you to isolate the exact spot in your survey area that's changed and the biggest uh i think the best use of it is like let's say you've done a we what we were looking for when we developed this tool was a way to subtract two backscatter data sets from each other that were collected by different instruments at different ranges and still be able to see where changes have occurred. And that's what the A minus B is best at. You can use it for other data types though. You can use it for bathymetry or um, any any two grids that you get into SonarWiz, you can use those. But it helps, uh, they don't have to be exactly the same type. They don't have to both be um, from the same instrument. So I really want to thank Echo81 for hosting us on that boat um, and letting us drive around all day testing our stuff. We were not uh, out there actually to collect bathymetry. We were there to test our software, but I really appreciate when customers give us a chance to get out on the boat and see our stuff in the real world uh, and help us fix things. So I just wanted to call them out and say thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching and we will be putting this on the web and please stay tuned. Uh, we'll have another webinar in two weeks where Patrick will be showing uh, some of the integrations that SonarWiz can do with other uh, software. So thank you very much.